general, a Django application in production looks like this. On the left side you have the web server and on the right side you have Django web framework. In between there may be a thing a called application server, like GUnicorn or uWhiskey for example. It is kind of obvious what a web server does. It receives an HTTP request, it parses it and somehow in a mysterious way that parsed request end up on the right side in a nice Django view. In this lesson we will explore what happens in between. In this part. To understand the middle part of the diagram we need to have a short look into the history of web. Web or HTTP protocol is static by design. This means it can only return you a static file on the server. So a web server receives a request, say get index, finds that page on the disk, reads index.html and returns a response with content of index.html file in its body. This may surprise you, but per HTTP design there cannot be such things as HTML forms. Because HTTP was designed to read pages like index.html images or maybe CSS files from hard disk and send them back as a response. But in the early 90s of the last century there were people who really wanted such things as HTML forms. The idea to process user input via HTML was a novelty at that time. But how to do that? And solution was following. The web server will process each incoming request as usually. For some requests it will not blindly send a response. Instead, it will invoke an external script, let's say python with form.py, pass to that script information about freshly processed request and return as response whatever this script returns. The idea was that the little script, in our example form.py, was supposed to process user input like information given in forms. Well, the thing is at that time they used Perl instead of Python, but I'll stick with Python examples. The web server was supposed to start external script by forking. If you ever did Unix system programming, you may know what forking is. If not, think of process forking as a biological cell division. The child process inherits from its parent a lot of information. And most importantly it inherits environment variables. So after web server finished parsing incoming request, it creates environment variables describing that request and then forks the Python script. Python script in its turn can read information about request from environment variables. From Python script point of view, to process user information, for example to save it in database, was just a matter of reading some environment variables which we know how to do it and send the output, well, response with print method. As simple as that. So in early 90s dynamic web programming looked like this. Developers created forms with action attribute containing path to the script that was supposed to process this form. User submits the form, then web server parses the request, detects that request is designated for an external script creates environment variables describing that request, forks the external script and returns as response whatever that external script output is. Initially those environment variables passed from web server to external script were randomly named. It was really up to web server developers to choose environment variables names and what information they carried. Because there were many web servers, I picture here Apache only as an example. So because there were many web servers with different environment variable names, it was really difficult to create scripts that run under different web servers. Portable scripts so to speak. In this context everybody figured out that it is a good to standardize environment variable names and their meaning. They carry similar information regardless of web server after all. And this is how CGI was born. What is CGI? CGI is a standard for the names and purpose of environment variables passed from web server to external scripts. CGI is an abbreviation from common gateway interface. A more descriptive name for this standard would be common environment variable names. Here are just a few of those environment variables. For example query string 
may be very familiar to you. Python community extended the idea of CGI even further. Instead of standardizing just environment variables, Python community standardized the way the script must be called. Any script to be called from web server must have a function. Let's call it nerdy, for example, with two parameters. The first parameter shall be a Python dictionary with CGI environment variables. The second parameter of nerdy function you do not need to care what it is. However, you must call it once within nerdy function. You must call second parameter in a specific way. First parameter of the foo will be returned HTTP status. And the second parameter of the foo will be HTTP headers list you want to return. The body of response shall be return value of nerdy function. Except these simple rules you can do whatever you want in your nerdy function. In fact, WSGI standard says that nerdy can be any callable. So it may be a Python class which implements a special call function. The stroke of genius in this standard is its simplicity and in the, and in the same time flexibility. On one side, for web servers, it is not a big deal to invoke Python script this way, because by the 2003 or in early 2000s, all web servers were operating with CGI scripts. And on the other side, developers can invoke web frameworks as complex as Django just by adhering to VSGI simple rules. The purpose of WSGI is to standardize the way external scripts were executed on web servers. It was designed to be easy called by web servers or easily integrated with any web server and flexible enough to execute any web framework with it. So, coming back to our form example, a WSGI script that processed form should have looked this way. I'm sure you are thinking now, wait a second, how does all this square with application server like GUnicorn or UWSGI? The thing is that while explaining CGI to you, I intentionally omitted one important problem. The important problem with CGI scripts is that loading external scripts takes way too much time. This is a graphical illustration of total time of processing one single HTTP request. The purple color is the time it takes for a web server to parse HTTP request and create environment variables. The blue color is the time it takes to process the request by Python script. The, the red color is the time it takes to load the Python binary from hard drive. The bottleneck of overall request processing is starting the new process. So for each and every request, most of the time was wasted on starting the new process. The forking thingy. And how to solve this? Well, we cannot get rid of forking, but we can fork or start external interpreters and their dependencies when web server is idle. Even better, when server is idle, we can fork multiple times. In this example, I forked Python interpreter three times. These three instances are called web server workers. Workers are in-memory instances of Python interpreter and all dependencies required to run them. This way, when request comes, it takes only web server time plus nerd function time, so to speak, to process it. This method, or technology if you like, is called pre-forking. Pre-forking is web server responsibility. Apache web server can pre-fork a WSGI application. In other words, Apache web server can run a Django application. And this is exactly what mod WSGI described in Django documentation does. Nginx, on the other hand, cannot pre-fork a VSGI app. However, Nginx can forward HTTP request to another web server which can pre-fork your VSGI application. And now try to guess the name of this square. I will wait for 3 seconds. If your answer was GUnicorn or UWSGI, you are absolutely right. Both of them are web servers. 
because they understand HTTP protocol, your WSGI can even serve static content for you, and both of them can pre-fork your WSGI app. And by now, you should understand that naming GUnicorn and UWSGI application servers is a little vague. A more appropriate name will be kind of web server or a minimal web server which additionally can pre-fork a WSGI app. And at the end of this lesson, I want to show you again this slide. On the left side are WSGI compatible web servers and on the right side are WSGI compatible web frameworks. The beauty of WSGI standard is that you can combine any item from the left with any item from the right side. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Thanks for watching.